Welcome to the Cervical Spine uh, Research Society's uh, second uh, webinar for the year on cervical disc arthroplasty. Uh, we're truly honored to have a, a really a truly worldwide perspective on this topic. Um, and so thank you very much for joining. Connect with CSRS through uh, many of our social media platforms uh, shown here. Um, also, uh, Clinical Spine Surgery is uh, the official CSRS journal. Um, and so we invite you to submit uh, your research papers focused on the cervical spine for possible inclusion in uh, upcoming uh, issues. And if you haven't done so already, um, definitely register for the uh, 51st annual uh, CSRS meeting and uh, instructional course uh, taking place uh, in Las Vegas uh, from November 29th to December 2nd. So registration is now open. Uh, so you can go ahead, register, um, uh, book a hotel, uh, and we look forward to uh, to seeing you here. I'd uh, like to thank the CSRS Education Committee for organizing uh, really this uh, spectacular event um, with uh, co-chairs uh, Dr. Mesfin and Dr. Wright. And uh, just a reminder, so um, this will be, you know, there will be a live discussion here at the end of the uh, at the end of the talks. So we want to make it as interactive as possible. And I'd like to introduce uh, my co-moderators here, uh, Dr. Lee Tan and uh, um, Dr. Rory Murphy, who will be introducing the speakers. It's my pleasure to introduce Dan Rue. He's a professor of orthopedic surgery at Columbia University and also a neurosur in the neurosurgery department at Weill Cornell. And I did my training in Wash U, and I know we're always trying to emulate his technique and try and learn the best options and try to figure out um, how he helped his patients. So I'm really looking forward to hearing um, Dan's uh, perspective on the cervical arthroplasties uh, that we're going to hear now. Thank you very much. I'm going to talk about cervical disc arthroplasty, the North American perspective. These are my disclosures. I do get royalties on some fusion products and do own some stock in some companies that have artificial disc replacements. In North America, the number of cervical disc arthroplasties has been steadily increasing. If you take a look from 2018 on, there's been a gradual increase, a little dip during the pandemic, but then it has been gradually increasing since then. And we expect that the market is going to continue to grow for the cervical disc arthroplasty market, which is in the dark uh, color here. The light blue is the lumbar disc replacement. And a lot of this is driven by patient demand. Patients come in saying that they don't want a fusion operation and also the data that shows really good outcomes with cervical disc arthroplasty. The indications in the United States in the initial FDA, Food and Drug Administration, investigational device exemption trials were for patients who had herniated discs, very mild spondylosis, and the levels had to be between C3 to C7. And this was mainly for patients who had radiculopathy although some patients with myelopathy were enrolled. Now, there are some arguments against doing arthroplasty for myelopathy because usually these patients have congenital stenosis, and such patients often are thought to do better with effusion. Uh, Lali Sekhon was the first one to try it and report on uh, arthroplasty for myelopathy. He put in a Brian arthroplasty device, and the patient uh, did well and continues to do well in long-term follow-up. We published this study in 2008 that showed that arthroplasty is actually equivalent to arthrodesis for myelopathy, but there are some caveats. We looked at patients who had received the prestige of the Bryan arthroplasty in the FDA IDE trials, and all patients, whether they had the CDA or the ACDF, did quite well. But these are for patients who have only retrodiscal, retro in other words, the problems behind the disc and not behind the vertebral body. And they were patients who had just one uh, level uh, issues. Ding et al. Uh, did this study that was retrospective on 37 patients with arthroplasty and 39 with ACDF. And at two years found no difference in uh, patients that were treated uh, for cervical spondylotic myelopathy. FAVE also published the study that showed that uh, myelopathy patients uh, did fine and there was no difference between arthroplasty and arthrodesis. And uh, this study in Journal of Neurosurgery Spine in 2017 found the same thing. Again, uh, patients with myelopathy with less than or equal to three-level disease uh, did fine with uh, a, either a hybrid or an ACDF. 
we published this study in 2018 that showed that um, uh, again, with a large number of patients uh, and with long-term follow-up, whether patients had radiculopathy or myelopathy made no difference that all groups did well with cervical disc arthroplasty. So as I said before, arthroplasty works if you decompress thoroughly, uh, you restore the height, there's no ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament, it's a retrodiscal disease, and there's no ligament and flavum hypertrophy so that uh, you can do an adequate decompression uh, with just an anterior operation and you don't have to go posteriorly to do the same thing. Less ideal is a person who has um, uh, a decreased disc height um, along with myelopathy. Uh, this is a patient who you can see has retrolisthesis as well as a decreased disc height. Now we may be able to restore some of that decreased disc height and, and therefore cure the retrolisthesis and uh, with some artificial disc replacements having different heights, I think that can be done, uh, but you have to be careful not to over distract the facet joints. Obvious contraindications are patients who have significant kyphosis, collapsed discs, uh, lots of facet arthrosis that are painful, um, ossifying diseases such as DISH or OPLL or ankylosing spondylitis are not good candidates, obviously, for an arthroplasty. And if you have severe osteoporosis, uh, for instance, if you had a 70-year-old female who is postmenopausal, even if they look like they're good candidates otherwise, uh, you got to make sure that you get a DEXA scan uh, because if they have severe osteoporosis, that the arthroplasty device may collapse. If you have significant anterolisthesis, that usually is due to facet remodeling, and therefore uh, they are likely to have facet arthritis and uh, therefore are not a good candidate for an artificial disc replacement. The advantages of arthroplasty is um, one of the main advantages has been uh, motion preservation, but if you really think about it and look carefully, it's not a lot of motion that you're preserving. You're only preserving about five to nine degrees of up and down motion and six to nine degrees, uh, six to nine millimeters of up and down motion and about seven to eight degrees of left and right um, uh, motion. So it's not a lot per level. But I believe that the recovery has significant advantages. This is a shoulder surgeon, and three weeks post-op, he said he golfed at Pebble Beach, and he said, I just hit this putt for par on the fame, famous 18 hole. No pain and feels great. And he's very thankful. And if I had done an ACDF, I would not have led him back to playing so early. This is a patient uh, who's a spine surgeon, and three days post-op, he goes and lifts 61 kilograms, and uh, you can see that he has really returned to uh, activities right away. And in fact, uh, he actually went back to work, uh, I believe, the day after the operation. Um, and this is really important in, uh, in athletes, high-performance athletes. And there are a lot of unknowns with this, like how long will it last? Are there problems with, with wear debris? Is it stable? And what are the outcomes? Well, I've done it in uh, a number of UFC fighters, one Olympic high jumper, an Olympic class swimmer, and a baseball player. Uh, this was a UFC fighter who um, uh, he has his information online, so it's not a HIPAA violation, but he had weakness, and uh, he talks about it in this uh, YouTube video about his artificial disc replacement that I did. And um, uh, he had uh, significant uh, weakness. We did the artificial disc replacement uh, for him. And uh, he returned to um, uh, uh, fighting uh, a few months later um, after I had made sure that the uh, artificial disc had bonded to the bone. Uh, this was a patient as a high jumper. And again, this is uh, available in um, uh, a lay uh, press, as you can see here in World Athletics, about his artificial disc replacement. And he's able to uh, return uh, to high jumping after that. Um, and I've also operated on elite uh, collegiate uh, wrestler who uh, was able to return to uh, uh, wrestling. You can see the artificial disc replacement uh, there that I put in in 2021. Uh, this is Jack Eichel, who I consulted on, uh, but uh, he had his friend uh, 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 Prusnak uh, do the operation, uh, and uh, he's returned to playing uh, hockey at a professional level. And um, and this again was not done by me, uh, but by uh, done by Bob Bray, uh, Tyler Johnson, uh, who's a professional hockey player, 
uh, had an arthroplasty and went back to uh, being able to play. Uh, we had planned on uh, doing an arthroplasty in this patient, but uh, uh, he actually ended up not needing it. And I've done it in uh, uh, patients who uh, do jujitsu, karate, judo, wrestling, hockey, weightlifting, baseball, and softball, and, uh, and they've all been able to return to play. So this is a paper that Reinke uh, published in World Neurosurgery uh, in 2017 that showed that uh, at 26 to 96 months, two pros and 20 semi-pros at that time, at a mean age of 40, were all able to return to their um, preoperative play. Now, what about arthroplasty uh, along with effusion in a hybrid kind of procedure? Well, there are insurance issues that I'll discuss later, and we don't really know what the long-term results are, but we have done arthroplasty in patients who've had prior arthroplasties, and we've done arthroplasties adjacent to effusion and a combination of an arthroplasty along with a fusion and even skip levels in patients who had had prior fusions uh, done before. Um, you can do a hybrid either above or below uh, the prior fusion, but there are insurance issues. As you can see in North America, these are some of the most popular insurances. And Medicare, which is in the middle, they don't allow any hybrids and they don't allow anything other than one or two level arthroplasties with a virgin spine. But at the end of, uh, other end of the extreme, uh, Aetna will allow us to do a hybrid. We can do a subsequent uh, artificial disc after a patient has had a prior fusion. Uh, we can also do a second um, ACDA if the person has had a, uh, a disc arthroplasty in the past. We can even take out an arthroplasty and put in a new arthroplasty. And, uh, or we can obviously do a two-level arthroplasty with the virgin operation, which all insurances now allow along with the single level. So in conclusion, arthroplasty is a very difficult operation to get absolutely perfect. You gotta do an incredibly thorough decompression. And if you leave one little bone spur behind, that's gonna cause symptoms. So you gotta know how to do a very thorough uncinate decompression, thorough posterior decompression. You have to use meticulous technique to make sure that it is perfectly centered, that it's correctly sized, not too far posteriorly, not too far anterior. And patient selection is very important, but if you get all things right, it actually is a very good operation and results in very fast recovery for patients. Well, thank you so much uh, for your kind attention uh, today, and I think uh, we're going to have uh, time for questions. All right. Um, thank you, Dr. Ru, for the fantastic talk. And uh, we'll hold all the questions until all three speakers have uh, um, finished. And uh, our next speaker is Dr. Fei-Fei Zhou from um, uh, Peking University Third Hospital. And he is the cervical section chief uh, uh, with uh, Dr. Sun there. And uh, he's very active uh, in CRSRS, and he'll provide us a um, uh, Asia perspective on cerebral arthroplasty. Um, so, Fifi, please go ahead and uh, present. Dear moderators, Professor Zhu, Professor Elvis, all of my colleagues online, I'm Dr. Fei Fei Zhou from Peking University Third Hospital, Beijing, China. I'm so happy to join this special webinar focusing on cervical disc arthroplasty. And I am so pleased to share the long term follow up data of CDR in China. We all know that. The primary principle of CDR is to preserve segmental motion and further to avoid accelerated adjacent segment generation or disease after traditional ACDF. The first CDR case with brain disc in Peking University Third Hospital was operated in 20 years ago by Professor Yu Sun with the kind help of Professor John Heller, who I personally respected deeply. We published our 10 year follow up data in 2016 along with the similar result from very famous Professor Jean Galvin in Belgium. Today, I will present our data in the following four aspects. The overall clinical outcome, range of motion, adjacent segment degeneration or disease, and complications. First of all, let's look at the overall clinical outcome. From our 10-year follow-up result, 42 treated levels were evaluated. The MJOA score of 25 malopathic patients was increased significantly from 11.8 preoperatively to 15.9 at the final follow-up. The NDI and the VS score in eight patients with radicalopathy were also decreased significantly at the final follow-up. 
so the neurological improvement is satisfied. Another long-term follow-up clinical study from Beijing Jishuitan Hospital, which is also very famous in China, showed the similar result of brain disc that neurological improvement is satisfied. We can also make the same conclusion from our 10-year follow-up research of Project C prosthesis. As artificial disc is a mobile device, we certainly care about the result of range of motion during the long-term follow-up. Unfortunately, our data show that the range of motion decreased significantly at the 10-year follow-up from 7.8 degrees on average before surgery to 4.7 degrees at the final follow-up. So the range of motion is not very satisfied at the long-term follow-up period. We also find the occurrence rate of heterotopic ossification and the spontaneous fusion at the same time was abnormally high, no matter in brand disc or protein C. And we found that the loss of uh, motion mostly occurred in atrial cases. We can see the range of motion of atrial group was 2.6 degrees. And in non-atrial group, the range of motion was nearly normal uh, compared to nearly uh, bigger than the pre-op range of motion, which was 9.3 degrees. So atrial formation is the main reason of decreased range of motion after CDR. We mentioned that the philosophy of CDR is to prevent secondary degeneration of adjacent segment by means of motion preservation of the target segment. So the question is, have we achieved that? In our brand disc study, among 63 adjacent segments uh, were evaluated. 30 segments developed radiographical adjacent segment degeneration and there was no recurrent radiculopathy or myelopathy due to adjacent segment disease. However, in our ProDC study, 50% adjacent segment showed radiographical adjacent segment degeneration, and three out of 50 segment clinical adjacent segment pathology occurred and reoperated. Finally, we will discuss the long term complication of the CDR, which we mentioned earlier the heterotopic ossification and the spontaneous fusion. This systematic review and the meta-analysis included 38 related studies. 33 of them reported atrial, and 30 articles reported severe atrial after the surgery. This study distributed mainly in Asia and followed by Europe and North America. So this article told that atrial seems an inevitable complication after CDR. New HO did not develop too much, but the uh, progression of HO did not stop. And we can see the HO formation is no, uh, there's no difference between HO formation, between different kind of processes. We can see uh, active C group uh, compared to the brand group, the HO occurrence rate and the spontaneous fusion rate were very high. And uh, we can see the same result happened in brand disc compared to the protein C. That, so there's no difference between different implant. And uh, there's also no difference between type, type of uh, cervical spondylosis, whatever the diagnosis before surgery is myelopathy or radiculopathy. What's more, atrial formation may cause loss of range of motion, resulting recurrent radiculopathic or myelopathic symptom at the adjacent level or narrow the neural foramen and the cervical spine, uh, canal causing recurrent radiculopathy or myelopathy at the adjacent level. All of this above may increase the incidence of recurrent cervical DDD and reoperation rate. In our case series, there was no reoperation due to clinical adjacent pathology and two patients were operated caused by progressive bone formation at the index level one patient suffered radicular arm pain, underwent ante uh, anterior bilateral oncus resection to decompress the neural foramen, and another patient had new onset myelopathic symptom. So we removed the brand disc and uh, decompressed the uh, spinal cord and the uh, nerve root about the new 
uh, ossified formation and then achieve segmental reconstruction and fusion using a titanium mesh. If we reviewed our annual CDR cases, we can see there is a sharp increase trend in the early five to six years and it dropped quickly in the next five years. In the recent five years, the number of our uh, CDR cases maintained stable. We use uh, uh, many devices from the beginning, brand disk, ProDC, and the later the ProDC Vivo, um, uh, Discover, and Prestige LP, and Bulgaria C. So we, we think during the past 20 years deeply on the ideal indication of disk, re 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 disk replacement. I had made a study when I was in Emory Span Center under Dr. Heller's uh, guidance. The results show that patients with more pre-op spondylosis had higher rates of post-op ossification, which indicated that patient selection is a key part in the long-term clinical outcome. If we look back to the inclusion and the exclu exclusion criteria in the FDA ID trial of ProDC, there were no in, uh, enough quantitative parameters. For example, what is the definition of mild degeneration? If that means the disc, the facet joint, or the uncus, and which part we need to evaluate. There's also no clear information to support the definition of normal or good uh, segmental mobility. How many degrees is good? So we did a quantitative analysis and I noted that the nine point pre op degeneration scale in cervical spine used the x ray uh, published in your spine uh, journal had a strong correlation to the long term post op atrial formation based on the cut of value in disc cut loss, anterior osteophyte formation, and amply scoliosis. Very mild degeneration of the charcoal level should be considered as the ideal indication of CDR. So we can see the global market of motion preserving surgery is growing year by year. In China, from last year, the price cut policy may have a negative influence on CDR surgery in the next few years. At the same time, the innovation of device is already in progress. There are different combinations of the material used in the end plate and the artificial nucleus. For example, metal on metal, and the metal on polyethylene or ceramic on ceramic. And on the, uh, on the same time, the new generation uh, artificial disc device should be fit to not only the structural an, uh, anatomy parameters, something like the shape of the end plate and uh, also the dynamic features, because for example, the center of rotation of the patient is, um, is changeable. So how can we make a uh, a dynamic artificial nucleus to fit the changeable center of rotation. For example, I will make an example. The axial shape of end plate in Chinese patients is quite different from patients in Europe and North America. It's very narrow and uh, during the between the uncus at the posterior part of the vertebral body. So spine surgeons in China have to erase part of the uncus to fit the current implant we use from Europe and uh, North America if we try to achieve the best end plate coverage to the artificial disc. So I suggest the new implant should take the adaption of different uh, races, different kind of uh, anatomical features, for example, the Asian features into account. Finally, in conclusion, according to the series of studies from China, on one hand, we think the design philosophy of CDR is correct because we all believe the nature mobility function of cervical spine we need every day. On the other hand, the clinical reality is still complicated that we also need to respect the aging power of human spine. That means the artificial disc device is not a whole life surgery to a individual patient. So right now, we still need to control the indication strictly because proper selection patient, good clinical results. Thank you for your kind attention. All right, Fei Fei, thanks uh, so much for a great uh, um, 
presentation and provide an Asian perspective on the arthroplasty and highlighting some of the complications and issues we may face and uh, perhaps also some racial differences uh, in outcome. And then the, our next speaker is uh, Professor Dr. Oscar Alves. Um, he is the head of neurosurgery at Hospital uh, Luz Sy uh, Syedas in Porto. And uh, he's also very active in CSRS Europe. Um, he is the executive board member as well as a treasurer for CSRS uh, Europe. He's also the co-chairman of the uh, International Academy of Spine as well as uh, board of directors for ISS. So more importantly, you know, it's uh, about uh, 2.30, uh, 3 a.m. in um, Port uh, Portugal. So I really appreciate uh, uh, Dr. Alves uh, taking the time to share his experience, European experience with us. So, okay, please uh, start. Uh, th thank you. So it's a great honor for me to be among these uh, eminent speakers. Uh, and I will try to, to convey the uh, European perspective. Um, I have to say that uh, I have no disclosures relevant for this presentation. And there are some factors that are not related to patients, which I call the, the cost noise. And if you look at this survey, uh, AO Spine International members, uh, they acknowledge that the price uh, pay, pay, uh, plays a big role whether or not they do an arthroplasty. Fortunately, in Portugal, we don't have such a bias because uh, the, the cost implant of an arthroplasty or an embedded cage with screws, it's uh, similar. As well, it is the, the, the reimbursement. So we can more uh, freely uh, choose one or the other. Uh, and why we do we do this? Because there is motion preservation long term, as in this study uh, you, you, can, you can see, uh, despite the occurrence of HO, as has been referred before. And there is also quality of motion. We had a study, one of my PhD students, showing that the, the center of rotation only takes its normal position after one year. And this is critical for outcome, as a, an altered uh, center of rotation can affect negatively the segmental and the global uh, range of motion. And also, the same study I showed before, hypermobility did not occur at age of uh, segment. So if you look at the, the, the alternative, which is fusion, you have secondary surgery uh, rate for adjacent segment conditions, about 21%, one in five patients, and zero close repair in 10% of patients. Uh, and if you look at the second surgery at the adjacent level, this is, the incidence is follow-up related. The more you follow up the patient, as you see here, the gap is widening. Same, same result with different devices here. It, 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 it widens the, the gap, and it seems that uh, there is a superiorness of, of uh, arthroplasty over ACDF. Uh, here, real-world data from large national insurance database in the US, 12% cheaper, and this is mainly due to uh, less uh, reoperation, which makes, with the five years follow-up possibility study, uh, arthroplasty highly cost-effective compared to ACDF in, in long-term follow-up. Although the, the initial uh, overall uh, hospital costs are higher, uh, there is less reoperation, less complication rates, increased return to work rates, as uh, Dan showed. So it's more cost effective over the lifetime of a patient. And this study assumes that there is a 20 years uh, survival of the protocol. Uh, cervical disc arthroplasty has been the most scrutinated in between spine surgery, and we have you have very high quality data across different devices, long term outcome and showing, suggesting that even two levels are better than one level. And none of these were three generation devices. The one who present with translation, they are compressible, they present greater resistance to, to angular motion. And I believe, due to the fact that the, the physiological location of the central rotation offloads passage and adjacent disc, you can have probably better results than uh, the literature shows with, with the first generation of devices. So <laughs> we have Preservation of range of motion, quality of motion, limit adjacent hypermobility uh, and less uh, disease and reoperation. Do we have favorable uh, surgical outcomes? In order to validate this technique, we need to have some data on that. And surgical imbalance is important because step forward is an increased SVA leads to neck pain and progression of myelopathy. Um, we, among our earlier patients, we did a study with 35 patients. These were the levels operative and uh, we got significantly increase uh, in low doses at the index level and the soul uh, and global low doses. And increasing global low doses derived essentially from the increase of low doses at the index level. Uh, one meta analysis showed that the global alignment also favors uh, arthroplasty. Sorry. And 
concerning adjacent level also moderate to high evidence that the adjacent segments are more lordotic after ADR than ACDF. Uh, then also mentioned here that uh, index level chi falls is in the contraindication. So why why this happens? And basically this is based on the Keen paper that showed that only 30% of pre-op kyphotic index level became a lordotic. And whereas pre-op global kyphosis resulted in lordosis in one third of the patient. So it seems that tarsoplast is more efficient in correcting global lordosis than index level lordosis. And there are many reasons for postoperative cervical kyphosis. Like if you have pre existing kyphosis, there's a absence of structural lordosis in the implant, excessive neck position and extension, distraction, and plate over drilling, loss of disc height, um, inappropriate insertion of the prosthesis, of course, the surgeon experience. And if you insert more procedurally located, you can have the chances of having more kyphosis. Let me just show you an example of one of our patients, 30 years old female. Uh, with with a two level disease, as you see here, uh, there is no loss of this type, and the patient has uh, kyphosis of minus thirteen point two degrees at five six. That was flexible, of course, but not fully reducible. You have some degree of kyphosis even in extension, and this is what we have done: two level arthroplasty, four years follow up, uh, lot of increase at C five six with a, with a remarkable change. In, from minus 13.3 to 5.3. And with a gain in range of motion along with better uh, sagittal alignment. And the center of rotation for the prosthesis with a good uh, location of the center of rotation. So we did a study, preliminary study, with patients that we identified in segmental kyphosis. We identified 33 patients, 25 kyphotic levels. These were the distribution of operated levels. And in all patients, that were kyphotic, they became lordotic, uh, as you see here with a significant key. And remember, in the team study, only 13% of those patients became lordotic. Uh, increase in C2C7 angle, not significant. Reduction of the SDA, not significant. And pre-op uh, T1 tilt had no influence on the, the, the reversal of the, the degree of kyphosis. And we know that patients with low T1 tilt are the ones who can reverse easily uh, kyphosis, but th this was not apparent in our study. Uh, I can show you also here another case that the, the, the structural uh, properties of uh, the, the, the implant were not sufficient. So we had to do some sort of uh, osteotomy to reformat C5 vertebra. And from day one to stop, there was a significant gain in surgical lordosis, as you can see here, that sustained over. Uh, three years of, of follow-up with the good, good alignment, uh, as you see here. So for us, arthroplasty allows reconstruction of segmental lordosis at index kyphotic level while preserving quality and range of motion. Of course, you, you neck uh, exercises are important in the long term. Uh, you, can have, you can do this technical tip of a procedure where it's shaped and play drilling to reformat the disc. And Reducible segmental kyphosis in my hands is not a contraindication for arthroplasty. You can read more about this in this book edited by Mehmet Zileli. We have we published a chapter on there. What about multi-level uh, cervical disc disease? Um, certainly, if you do a fusion, multi-level fusion, you can affect a lot uh, uh, the session on, on different planes. The, the, the loss of motion, bending forward is the most effective. And this is the, the, the amount of degrees that you need for your daily activities. Uh, you have to agree with me that rigid constructs are very different from motion preservation, as you see here, uh, as, as in two examples. And the um, multiple uh, fusion, like here, multi-level fusion for levels, it comes with uh, obscene rates of pseudoarthrosis that uh, need uh, surgery. And another important data is uh, the relation of multi-level fusion and aging. While you're aging, you have a tendency to increase SVA. And there will be an increase of the ratio between pre-op and post-op on adjacent disc levels. So something that you do at the, four, at the age of 30, 40 will have an implication later on in life. So I don't think that when you do multi-levels like this patient of mine, four years later, I had to do something over here. There are as happy as uh, this, this, this uh, lady here. So there is a negative impact on cervical uh, spine, global function status. And, it's fully tolerated when you assess those patients in, in terms of quality of life, especially young patients with higher uh, life expectancy. Um, Long-term follow-ups shows that 
if you do two levels, like you see here, you have better results. Uh, and the, the same here, it's, it's, it, it, you gain more if you do more levels of aquaplasty. Uh, we did a multi-level study with, with, uh, on, on five years with consecutive cases and by myself with a single device. We end up having two patients at two levels, 11 patients and three and four levels. Uh, this was the mean age, and look how young are all the patients with a good uh, follow-up. Uh, these were the levels operated. And in contrast with loss, completely loss of mobility of three and four level fusion surgery, you had good uh, increase in the delta of range of motion, global index, and the, the, the alignments in the, in the global alignment and the operative level. And there is no difference if you perform more than two level surgery. Here, one of our cases that was published in a, in a paper, uh, and you see a good, good, uh, good alignment and patient satisfied. Also, then uh, told us about his view on collapsed disc. There has been a contraindication. We tried to push it a little bit, and you know, I see more and more in my office this kind of patient, 49 years old, pain, uh, neck pain, arm pain, lemmic sign, M014. So a, a picture of myeloma radiculopathy, three, three level of compressive disc disease, minimal facet joint degeneration. Are you going to fuse those patients? It's a, a straight patient, as you see on the sagittal uh, balance. And this is what we end up doing to this patient. I don't use retractors to operate because this gives me a degree of freedom to go under the body and decompress. And this is the leverage maneuver I do at the end of the surgery to see if I see any movement, I'm available, I'm ready to insert a, a, a disc prosthesis. If not, I will do a thing. So 48 months post-op, uh, look uh, how the disc height was increased uh, from 2.6 to 6.6 .6 at the 4 or 5 level and also at the other level. Uh, also the nice alignment uh, in terms of sexual alignment and as you see here, the range of motion. So I believe that you are, when you're facing patients with uh, moderate forms of myelopathy, uh, you can offer a window of treatment uh, to treat earlier those patients that give you very good clinical results. Uh, and, and you see here, 48 months, asymptomatic decompression was not compromised. Another patient, 48, 49 years old male, I rank it official here in Portugal. Uh, this kind of picture that you, you see multi-level compressions and look how uh, dramatic the, the increase in disc height was. Uh, a case of a patient that uh, was operated in 2014, uh, ACDF on, on 656, um, MRI show adjacent segment at 45 and 67. This is the level that they operated in 2014. And see how collapse was the disc during the surgery. I was able to reformat the disc, insert a, a disc prosthesis, and with 68 months of follow up, we have this very nice result. The patient is happy and moving. Uh, so we did also study looking at our patients. We have more patients that we try to include in a, in a, in a bigger study. Uh, with pre-op disc height less than three millimeters, we identified 28 patients, 39 pathological levels. This was the delta of the disc height, uh, the, the, the angulation of uh, post-op at the index level, and the rate and the gain of the range of motion. And very interestingly, more collapsed discs show the higher increase in disc height as well as a higher range of motion in, in these cases. So collapse this less defined as less than three millimeters, that can be distracted two times over the, 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 than the pre-op this type with a substantial increase in range of motion and quality of motion. Some of those patients we have done, uh, we have studied the center of rotation. So it can be amenable to acroplasty in those situations. Of course, I agree. There are contraindications that are listed here, uh, significant facet joint degeneration, modic changes, uh, uh, if the spinal core is too much compressed, compressed large osteophytes on CT, OPLL, ankylosis, acropathy, uh, deformity, uh, excess of motion, osteoporosis, like then uh, told us, infection, usual uh, stuff. And I agree with, with, with our colleague from China that it's important patient selection and respect contraindications. Uh, poor candidates for arthroplasty are certainly more prone to complications. So in multi-level disc disease, you have to uh, consider each individual level for uh, surgical arthroplasty needs, and you need to scrutinize and identify uh, contraindications. Uh, very briefly, and this is for me the, mo the most uh, strong, compelling argument for arthroplasty, 
is what I call the compensatory biomechanics, biokinematics, and that we are looking at that nowadays. Uh, this is I borrow from uh, Dr. Pat Warden, amazing work he has done, and show us that while you increase your cervical SVA while you are aging, you have an hyperextension of C0C2 and a compensatory flexion at C C2 to C7. So if you do a fusion at the age of 30 uh, or 40, you are abolishing this compensatory uh, mechanism. And uh, just show you a case here, 45 female, uh, myelopathic patient. Look at how, uh, how is the, 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 the reflection extension MRI. And this is what we did for level arthroplasty. And look, uh, we are looking at this data now. Uh, there was a slight increase in, in cervical SVA and increase in low doses, decrease in low doses at C2C7 and patient for the moment is, uh, is happy. Also then uh, pointed that uh, uh, hyperostosis with DISH, uh, it's a contraindication. I done this patient many years ago. Uh, she, had, she had a two-level disc disease with this anterior osteophyte, dysphagia. I could remodel all this spine, insert an arthroplasty, uh, and seven years uh, follow up, she's very happy. And we are looking at the different uh, um, over time, there was some loss of segmental low doses, but the disc protein was mobile. And over time, there was variation in C5-6 and C7 angles to adapt to, to do the global uh, line. Uh, another case here, two-level disease. And you see good range of motion coupled with positive sexual balance and uh, eight years follow-up, some sort of uh, adapt, uh, compensatory mechanism going on. Um, so if you want to read more about our expanding educations we have published uh, this uh, this uh, chapter i've also published uh, in 2021 on neurosurgical clinics of north america the expanding education and i thank you so much for uh, listening to me thank you all right thank you dr alvis that's a fantastic talk and uh thanks for providing a european perspective so i think we can open up for the discussion right uh maria can you let uh, everybody unmute and perhaps we can start uh there we go. Okay. Um, well, Dr. Alvis, I have a, a quick question um, for you. So I think, you know, obviously you showed a, a lot of amazing cases and some of the cases, you know, I, I would say in the U.S., um, we would uh, probably say the, the patient, you know, that it, it has some contraindication uh, and may not be the best candidate for it, especially, you know, in this patient with kyphosis and collapsed um, this space. Is there any tips and tricks that uh, you can offer the audience? Uh, how do you actually um, open up the uh, this space? Um, and uh, you know, do you encounter any you know kind of stretching of the uh, you know? Sometimes you over distract the facet. Patient can have pain. Do they report transient pain post up from that? Um, and also, you know, how do you avoid HO? Um, you know, our Dr. Joe from China, you know, presented a pretty high instance uh, of HO in the Chinese population. Do you have a specific uh, sort of uh, post-op protocol you follow with NSAIDs or um, Celebrex or whatnot? Um, uh, what, what are your protocol for, for those right. uh, great results? I mean, starting from uh, the last question, we, we certainly have less HO than the data that was shown. And I'm convinced from our data that the most important is the end plate cover. The more end plate cover you have, the less HO. That's definitely the most important thing. Uh, and then, of course, uh, you need to... to uh, to, to remove the OPLL, the, 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 the posterior ligament, which for me has several advantages. You know, you can go behind, look at if there is any disc fragment. That's the only way you can decompress osteophyte because you cannot go between the, the, the bone and, and the ligament. You have to go underneath the ligament. And the ligament itself is like a scaffold for ossification. So all my patients, I take the ligament. If you, by taking the ligament, it's, it, you, don't, you don't lose too much stability. That's known. Um, of course, uh, irrigation and anteriorly, I always seal the interface between the, 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 the end plate and, and, the, and the plate and the, the end plate of the prosthesis with bone wax. Uh, this is really the tips and tricks that I use. Okay. Uh, regarding our first question, I, I just uh, shared the, the then uh, view because uh, this is a very demanding surgery in terms of the compression. If you you have to go beyond the anatomical compression. You have to put some functional decompression because if you leave something behind in the extremes of lateral bending, 
there will be some engaging of the nerve and recurrence of, of symptoms. So you, one, you have to be very careful. So just spread a little bit more laterally. And then when it comes to reconstruction, uh, try to use the bigger protein that you can and always center it to have best biokinematical results. It would be my, let's say, first indication and first advice. <laughs> Um, a question. Uh, thank you, Oscar. And that's a question to all of you, Feifei, Oscar, and Dan. I think you all touched upon the importance of central rotation. Um, do you have any tricks or techniques to maybe help identify uh, the optimal place for a central rotation when you're placing your implant? Now, I know all implants are slightly different. I think they're all somewhat comparable. But in a patient where you may have an option of placing the implant in a di different location on the implant, how do you pick the optimal area for central rotation matrix there? Well, I can, I, I mean, unfortunately, I wish I had a, some sort of software where I could calculate the central rotation. And like Fefe said, uh, have approaches that can adapt to the central rotation. We all know that the central rotation changes according to the level that you are operating. And we have most of the proteins that we use, they have more or less fixed central rotation. Uh, and also with the generation of the spine, the, the central rotation location changes. So I think there's a lot of work to do there. And um, our understanding of this right now is kind of a kindergarten understanding. I, I don't think we have good clues or good data uh, to support us. So it would be nice to have some sort of uh, preoperative uh, central ro of rotation location study. So I think the most important thing is to get the disc as far back as you can. Uh, one of the biggest mistakes that people make when they start doing arthroplasty is that they put it way too anteriorly and they undersize it. So you want to fill the disc as much as you can from front to back. And um, and if you're limited in your size because you have a huge patient, you want to get it as far back as you can. Now, there are some discs that uh, you don't do any end plate prep and you put it in that fits the concavity of uh, uh, the inferior end plate of the cranial level. And uh, for those, you just want to get it as large a prosthesis as possible to fit properly. If you're planing off the end plate, then it's much more important uh, that you fill it from front to back. Um, but uh, the largest prosthesis that uh, fits in, uh, in the disc is, I think, the best way to go about it. Yes, for me, I think uh, the center of rotation was divided um, different design principles uh, into different prothesis. So they may uh, design for the different center of rotation uh, for the different levels of the cervical spine. So uh, intraoperatively, as uh, Professor Yu mentioned that we need to uh, complete the, the best footprint, the coverage of the end plate of the cervical spine, the disc space. And uh, we may just um, cannot achieve the ideal uh, center of rotation dynamically according to the uh, physiological uh, situation before the surgery. So we may uh, do some uh, work uh, to achieve the intraoperative measurement to uh, assess uh, the best center of rotation of the index level. Great. And I think we have a couple of questions from our audience regarding HRO. Uh, the first one is from Dr. Patrick McNulty. And he's wondering if, uh, you know, what's your protocol on the medication to prevent uh, bony ingrowth after um, cervical arthroplasty? And the second one is from Dr. Ram uh, Mudiam, um, you know, does use of the, the high-speed burr increase the risk of HL? What, what, what are your uh, perspectives on those two questions? Maybe, uh, Dr. Ru, you can start, followed by Dr. Tro and uh, Dr. Alves. Sure. I don't use any chemoprophylaxis uh, with NSAIDs. I never did, and I didn't find much of a difference. I do think that it's not the high-speed burr. It's the fact that if you leave bone dust behind, Oscar mentioned it earlier, uh, I irrigate with a, a large uh, bulb irrigator as well as a 20cc syringe irrigator. The syringe irrigator, I call it high pressure, low volume. And the bulb irrigator, I call it high volume, low pressure. And I, I wash all the bone dust out until it's completely... Uh, until under the microscope, I don't see any bony uh, uh, dust fragments. And then um, I, like uh, Oscar, I put bone wax on the surfaces. So I strip the periosteum off of the cranial and caudal anterior vertebra. I take down the posterior longitudinal ligament completely. 
I uh, cauterize the ends of those because uh, I think they're traction spurs in the back. And anteriorly, it's the irritation of the uh, periosteum that incites the bone formation. So by completely uh, using a uh, monopolar electrocautery to burn the anterior periosteum off and then bone waxing it, I think we can see lower rates of um, heterotopic ossification. Okay, for me, uh, we suggest the patient underwent disc replacement with uh, two to four weeks of NSAID medication after the surgery, but there is no strong uh, recommendation about the evidence to support the usage of the NSAIDs after the surgery can uh, decrease the incidence rate of atrial. And uh, interoperatively, I uh, fully uh, uh, agreed with uh, Professor Zhu's mention that about the uh, irrigation and the bone wax. Thank you. I don't use uh, any, any form of uh, chemoprophylaxis either. And I share the, the views of uh, what I explained before and then if I said. Um, <clears throat> Doctor, sorry, go ahead, Dan. Oh, oh sorry. One, one question I, I had that nobody actually uh, talked about was uh, the opposite of HO, which is osteolysis. And uh, that's a significant problem. Um, and uh, it's often you culture it and you don't get P acnes or, uh, you know, you don't get any kind of indolent organisms and yet you see it and it's uh, always thought to be a reaction to the bone, um, third body wear and uh, to debris that uh, uh, elicits a phagocytic response. Uh, but um, I have uh, treated probably about half a dozen patients with significant osteolysis where the prosthesis has uh, incited a huge osteolytic reaction requiring ACDFs, corpectomies, front back operations, et cetera. So um, I, I thought it'd be interesting uh, to bring that up. Yeah, I mean, then it's, it's really important and we see it more and more in the literature, like his reports, we don't have good data. Uh, Scott Young, Matthew Scott Young from Australia showed some data, but it's, it's, it's not, uh, structured data in my opinion. On my, on my experience, I never had the, 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 the occasion to revise a patient. So I don't see uh, clinically relevant osteolysis. I'm sure there is some. And what I can tell is we are right now conducting a study looking at our oldest patients uh, because we don't know either what's the timeline of this osteolysis. If it is uh, next to surgery or 10 years later or whatever. So we are calling our all, all our patients and doing uh, now this study, uh, and that, you, you you might have seen also osteolysis with cages without screws in standalone cages. That is also osteolysis. I have patients with that, so um, and I guess that some of those patients there were some events like dental treatments, stuff like that, that we need to to inquire those patients on that, so to to, to have a better idea of what's going on, what's the mechanism. Um, I wanted to uh, bring up a question. So, so Dr. Alves, you, you showed in your, your video there um, with your surgical technique and, and sort of, uh, um, uh, you know, I wanted to just comment on, on, the, on, the, on the video. It, it seemed like there was a multi-level decompression. Um, so do you do all your decompressions first and then insert the implants sort of one after the other? Um, or are you doing a complete decompression and then inserting the implant and then moving on to the next level um, and so on and so forth? So I thought it was interesting um, that, that you know you showed that video yeah right so no what i do normally i, I start with the level where the decompression is, is most uh, exuberant most important where the compression is more if there is no predominant i start from the bottom do the decompression first and the reconstruction also starting from the bottom where you know you have bigger disc spaces and you know, that, that's that's my my rationale behind it, the, the technique Sure. So you're so you're doing the entire decompression and then putting in the implant and moving on to the next level. Is no, that right? no, no. All the compression first, all levels, and okay. then implant. And then all the implants. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. And and so uh so so uh, Dan, is that is that how you do yours as well? Or no, I uh, I do it level by level. And so Oscar, I imagine that you're using garden wells tongs and not uh, cast bar distraction since you're doing all the decompressions at once. I, I switched to garden wells tongs a number of years ago. Um, and, uh, it's just a little bit, you, you save that step. So what the fellow was doing it and they misplaced the cast part pins, you can, uh, mis distract the, the space. 
and uh, and and sometimes if you're doing multiple levels and you use a keel device, then uh, then it uh, gets in the way because you cut two keels and you got to be moving that uh, cast bar pin back and forth. Um, but I just find it easier to do one level at a time and then just move down. I mean, the, the reason I use a lot of drill and uh, that's why I, I, I like to finish up all my bone work first mm -hmm. uh, to protect the level, uh, to protect the implant uh, from bone dust and, you know, just, just and then wash, wash, copiously and then uh, put the implants. That, that's just for me. That's the reason. And that is, I don't use this Casper retractors because really I use the suction as a lever and I can go and angulate. You know, I have very nice pictures where coming from a bottom disc space and upper disc space, the carries and almost meet behind the vertebral body. If you use a retractor in the middle, you know, the pins, you cannot do this angulation. I find very difficult. <laughs> and you're using tongs? No, no, I mean, just, just, uh, no, not not really, not really. All is done with this suction release and then with the, with the leverage maneuver. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I think it's interesting because, um, you know, it almost seemed like in your presentation, you're describing it as, as, as something that can, you know, a procedure that can correct kyphosis um, with lots of sort of multi-level applications, you know, and I think, I think in the U.S. we're essentially kind of limited to, to two-level no, uh, no. classes. And so, so I wonder kind of coming back to the U.S. perspective here, uh, Dr. Rue, like, do you think that we can start to see expansion of indications, you know, here, because it's, it's really interesting, you know, kind of listening to or seeing the sort of world worldwide perspectives and how different, you know, what's a contraindication, you know, here is almost an indication, you know, somewhere else. So, you know, I thought, I thought that was very interesting. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I would love to be able to do more than two levels in the U.S. Uh, we can't. So I've done uh, three level arthroplasties and maybe half a dozen patients, but those are billionaires who, um, are able to afford uh, paying for the other two by themselves or another one by themselves. And they say, I don't care what it costs, I'm getting an artificial disc. And you know, in, in New York, uh, that addition of an artificial disc, it's $5,000 for a prosthesis. The hospital upcharges by about $15,000. So it's gonna cost, and, and, and the hospital charges for my services somewhere, I think between five and 10,000, there may be 15,000 for all I know. So the patient is paying something like twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars per level, in addition to their copays, and so the average person—that's the price of a car, and uh, and so for the average person, I don't even bring it up because when they bring it up, I say, listen, that's a lot of money. I I would rather buy a car than uh, have an artificial disc because we're only saving this much up and down motion, and I don't think it's worth that kind of money, frankly. But if it's if if that's what you pay for your lunch money, uh, you know, flying your private jet across the country to go to your favorite lunch place, then I can understand paying for that. But for the average person, I just sure. don't think it's a reasonable thing until insurance uh, covers it. And I think that kind of comes to our next question here in the chat. I mean, there's been a few questions about sort of hybrid um, constructs, you know, so you have, so he would say, so you say here in the US, you have a patient with, let's say, three level disease, um, you know, young patient and uh, maybe the one that you, you were thinking that would be would be great for a three level arthroplasty potentially. But now so now are you going to consider a, a hybrid construct on this patient um, and, and sort of, you know, I think if, if you guys can touch a little bit on hybrid constructs, uh, that'd be great. Yeah, in the U.S. now, as I said, a, a number of insurances allow for hybrids. Uh, I've had several different kinds of Blue Cross uh, cover it. Aetna covers it. Um, Medicare does not. Uh, there are a couple of uh, different uh, kind of companies that are now covering it. I think uh, uh, United Healthcare and Oxford are just starting to cover it. So we can get that done. Um, whereas even a year ago, we couldn't do hybrids. Uh, so the, the, the landscape is definitely changing in the US, I think for the better, because uh, I've got a patient that needs a four level operation. And uh, if we do a four level fusion, I would do a front back on that person. But the insurance just came back and uh, said that they would approve an artificial disc replacement at C3-4. And then she has uh, retrovertebral disease behind C5. So I got to do a perpectomy and then an ACDF at C6-7. None of the insurances in the United States allow for a skip. So you can't do C3-4 and C6-7 and do a fusion in between, which would be nice to do also. So I've done those. But again, it's when the patient is paid out of pocket. Right. So, you know, most of what I showed them, it, it relates to what you said before. Uh, I'm, it's really a privilege here in, in Europe, in Portugal, where uh, this prosthesis is almost the same price as a cage with embedded screws. So 
I have no these cost buyers. I get the same money for the surgery. So I can honestly offer one or the other. And that's exactly the case with hybrid construct. And, you know, when you have multi-level disease, you don't have all the discs with the same level of degeneration. You have different levels of degeneration. So it's a very nice idea to use uh, fusion in the most degenerated discs and save the ones with with less degeneration for arthroplasty. This is a basic, a general rule. Uh, also, you can do uh, you can do uh, fusion in the less mobile uh, segment. You know, we, we all the segments that they don't move with the same angulation. So you can also save all those for for fusion and do the others, the most mobile for arthroplasty. This is the, the the kind of setting that I use. Uh, follow up question to that. Um, a question I always ask myself is, if you are doing a hybrid, uh, do you use structure allograft for the um, fusion level or do you use a titanium spacer? Um, do you have any thoughts on that or, or opinions? Well, in China, we, oh, sorry, sorry, please. No, no, you, please. Uh, okay. So in China, we always use a PK to be the uh, autograft used in the uh, fusion uh, segment procedure. And uh, recently I mentioned uh, in my uh, presentation that in China, there is uh, a price cutting policy uh, from last year. So the price from economically, they almost the same. So I think there's no more choice for Chinese spine surgeons to use during our procedures. So uh, in fusion surgery, we always choose uh, Photographed and uh, recent years we used a 3D point uh, device uh, to save the uh, autograft and uh, we try to cut the usage of the allograft that the, uh, the, the 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 situation in China and uh, just to follow the uh, my comment in the multi level uh, uh, disease because in East Asia the developmental corneal stenosis is the very important. Uh, pathology before the surgery. If there is a multi-level uh, pathology, we need to decompress the multi-level. So um, we may choose posteriorly instead of the multi-level um, CDR. Okay. One additional question from our audience is that, uh, you know, is uh, a coronal curvature a contraindication? Say if someone has, um, let's say, thoracolumbar scoliosis or just a mild sort of uh, cervical scoliosis, um, they have radiculopathy on the concavity, and that's why they develop, you know, radic as a younger patient. Is that someone you would consider arthroplasty or is ACDF the uh, better procedure in that setting? Yeah, I don't have any experience doing severe coronal deformities uh, with arthroplasties because uh, all of those were contraindicated in the original FDA IDE trials. And uh, so if you... Um, yeah, I do think that it's probably fine to do um, uh, arthroplasties in many of those patients. So if it's the coronal deformity itself that's causing the compression, you can't decompress it adequately. Uh, it's not a good idea, obviously. But I think if you can de decompress it, because that person has been living with that coronal deformity for a long time and where they were asymptomatic before. So if you can get them back to the way they were before they grew the bone spurs and everything else, I think it probably would work. I also do know, though, that if you asymmetrically load a disc, it'll fall apart faster. Um, and uh, there are examples of revision cases in the US where the surgeon puts the arthroplasty way over on one side or they you know, angulate it so that on the coronal plane, it's like this to begin with and they wear out. And uh, so they wear out faster. So I think there are some concerns with um, long-term viability in that population but um, I don't have the experience to be able to tell you whether it's a great idea or not. Okay, great. Well, uh, I, I have no experience with scoliosis. I would not advise it unless in the very exceptional case that the scoliosis come from an asymmetrical disc degeneration that you can somehow reformat with, with your discectomy and your, your bone work. And that you could reformat on, on very nice and parallel end plates. But otherwise, I, I would not advise it. Yes, I also personally disagree with the usage of the disc replacement in the um, coronal imbalance uh, case. And uh, also, I don't think the implant defined for this kind of indication. And uh, I think, you know, uh, maybe we'll take one last question from the audience, uh, given the time. Um, 
Dr. Andre uh, Radelli, who um, visited Dr. Ru when I was a fellow uh, in Colombia. He asked, uh, he has a question for you, Dr. Alves. Uh, so he said that in Italy, the uh, ACDF and the arthroplasty are reimbursed the same, you know, uh, same as uh, in Portugal. Therefore, hospital seems to pressure the surgeons to do ACDF instead because then, you know, there, it's cost less to the hospital. He wonders that, is that the same um, in Portugal? And how do you deal with that pressure from the hospital administration? Right. No, I mean, the, the surgeon reimbursement is really the same. You do an arthroplasty or diffusion, which I don't think is the case in the US, right? You, you guys get less money for for arthroplasty. Um, I, I think what he's saying is that the no, hospital... I know, I know, I know. Yeah, right. No, I, I mean, it's it's really a very small difference of money that from arthroplasty implant or, or cage with with the embedded screws, it's, it's a really marginal difference. So we are not really pressed with that. So, so Andrea, you're saying use more expensive ACDF implants, therefore they'll prove it. Yeah. I mean, that's why I could do all this kind of work. <laughs> yeah. Because we are not a rich country here. So uh, that's why I could push the limits and expand the indication because it was really not more expensive than the usual, the usual case with, with screws. Okay, great. All right. Well, I, I think we're uh, right on time. So, um, Thank you everyone for, you know, giving us a, such a great perspective, uh, uh, global perspective. Uh, any last words, Rory and uh, Elias? No, I think we're really fortunate to have uh, uh, such a, a, world, a worldwide perspective and global pa panel here. Uh, look forward to seeing everybody at uh, CSRS in uh, Las Vegas meeting. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.